All right, so our final video for this third unit of the chemistry class this year uh, has to do with a brief history of the periodic table. What I'm going to do is tell you about four people who helped uh, kind of develop the early versions of the periodic table and how they gave us uh, help in getting to the table that we use and take for granted sometimes today. So along the way, there were a lot of people who uh, helped, uh, try helped to try to organize the elements in some way. And one of the things that they had to do was look for properties that were in common. And they looked for ways then to, to connect the elements to each other or organize them in some way other than just, say, alphabetizing them or something. So they looked for a sensible way to arrange them uh, based on properties that they did know at the time. They didn't know nearly as much about elements uh, 200, 300 years ago as we did, or as we do rather now today. Uh, and so they had to base it on pretty simple properties, really like density, things like atomic mass, color, the hardness of the element, how well it conducted electricity, uh, the things that it reacted with and didn't react with, and the kind of you know compounds that it was forming. And so because they didn't know as much as we now, we now know, uh, things like quantum numbers, which are fairly new in our history, they had to find some other way to do it. One of the first uh, developers of, of some organizational structures, a fellow by the name of Johann de Bruyner, and he lived in the early 1800s and is uh, credited with something called triads. What he observed is that certain groups of three elements, when you put them together in a little trio or a triad, they shared similar properties. And he noticed an interesting kind of mathematical thing in that they were also related by their atomic masses. He found that the elements in his triads would be an element with a light mass, an element with a heavy mass, and then an element with a mass that's halfway in between. And again, he called them triads. Okay, so what? Here are three elements, or group, rather five sets of three elements, that would be considered triads of de Bruyne. You see on the first row here we have lithium, sodium, and potassium. The mass of lithium is about 7 AMUs. The mass of potassium is about 39. If you average those together, you see here in the final column, the average of those two is 23. And the third element of the triad, that middle one, is sodium, whose mass is 23. Calcium's mass in the next triad is about 40 AMUs. Barium is about 137. If you average those out, you come out right around 88. And strontium is the third member of that triad with a mass of 87.5. There are a few other examples here. Chlorine and iodine average out to around bromine's mass. Sulfur and tellurium average out to right around selenium's mass. Carbon and oxygen average out to 14 AMUs, which is nitrogen's mass. So here are five triads, a light, a medium, and a heavy. Okay. Well, so what? If you look at the periodic table today, those five groups of three elements that I just mentioned are highlighted here in little sets of three, okay, all over the periodic table. So what, right? Well, the important thing to remember is that de Bruyne in the early 1800s did not have this periodic table. He couldn't go to our, what we see as our periodic table today, and just pick out three elements that had some kind of relationship by mass by picking three that were neighbors in the periodic table. He was putting together three elements 200 years ago that we now know and find on our periodic table are, in fact, neighbors. And so that's a pretty new deal. It's kind of like predicting that they would be a, a set of three before you ever knew that 200 years later, voila, that they'd show up on the periodic table as a group. So it turned out that his triads did have some kind of relationship. He just didn't have the big picture yet like we have, and that's what you're seeing here on the screen. So you can keep in mind that he was doing all this blindly and that his triads we only now know are found as part of our actual periodic table today. Our second character is a fellow by the name of John Newlands, and he did his work in the middle 1800s. He arranged the elements into the first periodic table, we would say. De Bruyne wasn't really making a table. He was organizing them into little groups, but it's not really a table like we'd imagine it being today. What he did was put the elements in order from smallest to largest atomic mass, or in other words, from lightest to heaviest. His table at the time included about 56 elements, and he had about 11 groups. So remember back in the last video, groups are those vertical columns of the periodic table. And Newlands's table had about 11 groups here and there. They were kind of spotty. They were kind of imperfect or incomplete. That's about what he had on his table. And what he noticed is something called the law of octaves. He observed that each element in his table showed similar properties to the eighth element following it in the table. And so, for example, in this, in this grid, or this little, this little row of colored elements here, you notice that lithium and sodium are both in green. They follow the arrows. And then right behind them, beryllium and magnesium are both kind of orange. 
boron and aluminum are both yellow, carbon and silicon are both light blue, and so forth. So those two elements, new ones would describe, and we would say now, are an octave apart. Lithium is an octave from, from sodium, and boron is an, is an octave from aluminum. He called this, this he called it this because it reminded him of octaves in music. Some some of you I know are very musically talented, and some of you are at least familiar with music to the extent that you know perhaps that a musical scale, if we disregard sharps and flats, a musical scale is A B C D E F G, and it starts over A B C D E F G in the next octave up on a keyboard. And so, if we look at octaves in music as octaves on the periodic table, lithium is like the A on a keyboard beryllium the B, boron the C, so forth and up, lithium and sodium would be one octave apart. And if you play those two keys on the keyboard, we know that they sound they sound the same in some way. That's really hard to even explain uh, to someone who doesn't do music. If you're a part of music or a singer or play an instrument, you know that two A's or two B's or two G's, whatever the element might or the element, whatever the, the note might be, they just sound right. They sound the same. And so much like that, he called it the law of octaves for his periodic table. It also reminds me, and lots of other people, of, of a calendar. So if you're not much for music, then you at least know that, say, on a, period, on a calendar, two Sundays kind of have the same feel, a consecutive Sundays. Every Sunday maybe has the same feeling for, me, for you. Maybe you go to church uh, every Sunday, or maybe every Sunday you have uh, the same shift at work, or every Sunday afternoon you talk your mom into taking you to Cherryberry for a, for a big cup of healthy, <clears throat> healthy frozen yogurt, um, and so forth. Um, every Friday definitely has a feeling. Every Monday, oh, don't we know it? Every Monday has a feeling. And so, much like that, if lithium and sodium are your Sundays, and then beryllium and magnesium are your Mondays, and boron and aluminum on the screen there are your, are your Tuesdays, and so forth, every time we get to that same color, it's like a day of the week, and it has the same kind of a feel to it. And he found that same, kind of, same sort of rhythm. Now again, we know today that lithium and sodium are neighbors on the periodic table in the same group, the alkali metals and that fluorine and chlorine are in the same group, those halogens. New ones didn't have the periodic table that we have today to know that his, his octaves law actually did make sense. The third person is probably the, the key character all along here, and his name is Dmitry Mendeleev. Nice picture of him here on the side. He sounds exactly like his name or makes me think exactly of a fellow who would look like this. A uh, rather big bushy beard, sort of unkept, looks kind of mean. Probably a real nice guy, I don't know. Um, but in any case, what he did that makes him kind of note noteworthy, uh, actually a few things. One, he took Newlands' table and he made it wider, okay, nearly as wide as today's periodic table. He also um, added a bunch more elements then to fill in those spaces, but he still based it on atomic mass. That's an important thing to note. He's still basing it on lightest elements up to heaviest elements at, at the end, and he made new rows based on uh, mass uh, sequences. And what he did that's, that's important is, well, twofold. One, he left spaces in his periodic table for elements that he believed would be discovered later. Okay, you have to be discovered elements. Sort of blazed a trail for people who would find those elements 5, 10, 20, 50 years after he, he came and went. And importantly, he also predicted the properties of those future elements super accurately. And he would come up with then, for example, uh, the idea that there will someday be an element that is like silicon. And so he called it Eka silicon. I believe Eka is from the Greek for the for like or similar to. And so Eka silicon will be an element that's like silicon. Today we now call that germanium, which is right below silicon on the periodic table. And he believed there'd be an element that was like aluminum. He called it Eka aluminum. And we now know that to be gallium on our periodic table. He believed Eka boron would exist. And that would be an element like scandium, which isn't directly below boron, but it's in the neighborhood. It has something else in common in terms of electrons that we can look at more closely later on. What we find, um, basically, is that some of his predictions were kind of like drawing a best fit line. Um, if you take data for the elements that we have, and then there's some elements, more elements that we have further up, if there's elements sort of missing in between on the periodic table, you can guess that if the densities are increasing gradually, and we don't have any elements in the middle of that, of that sequence, that the next elements to be found will have a density somewhere between the low ones and the high ones right along a best fit line. That's the idea. And he was known uh, in the day 
to have cards with element properties on them. He would lay them out on long train trips and move them around and, and lay them out and move them around again and try to find these patterns. You can about imagine seeing this fellow here uh, on a train trip across the aisle from you perhaps in, in the middle 1800s and here he is uh, ferociously with his cards moving them around trying to figure this out. Uh, I'm sure he got plenty of odd looks. And along comes our final character whose name is Henry Mosley. Mosley lived around World War I times and sadly Mosley uh, was actually a very young man when he was shot and killed during World War I. He fought for the British and was shot by a sniper in World War I. And so a genius frankly in, in his early 20s who came up with the periodic law and then wound up in, in World War I and was shot and killed um, was never able to add more to our understanding of well, atomic theory or periodic uh, table sort of theory um, and, and didn't contribute to anything else. So sort of tragic in the world of, of chemistry. What he did that's critical and really important and actually gives us a periodic table like today's is that he took the periodic table elements and instead of putting them in order by mass like new ones did, like Mendeleev did, he put the elements in order by atomic number which we know from way back in unit one is the number of protons. Okay. The reason he did this isn't because he's so much smarter than the other guys. It's that by now, in the early 1900s, guys like Rutherford uh, had come along and done their work. Guys like Thompson had done their work and Bohr. And all these people had figured out things that at the time of uh, Mendeleev we didn't know. And so because he could stand on the shoulder of those giants who came before him, he could see further as the old Newton quote goes. And so, because of that, he could build his periodic table based on something other than mass, and he did. And when he did that, it actually took care of a few glitches that Mendeleev had in his table. And I imagine we're among those things that would drive him crazy on those train trips, for example. Why can't I figure out the way to get rid of these little bumps and glitches in my table? Well, Mosley, with simple rearrangement by, by protons or by atomic number, found that the problems went away. And I can explain those more easily in class than I can in a video, so I'll do that for you there. What Mosley gives us then is something called the periodic law. And this is a really, really big idea of, of chemistry. In fact, it's kind of one of those fundamental truths of chemistry that makes it all happen. And what it says is that the properties of the elements repeat at regular intervals when arranged in order of increasing atomic number. So we're putting the periodic table in order by atomic number from 1 up to 118 protons on our current table. And he found that the periodic table, when, when laid out that way, would show properties repeating at regular intervals. Now what is a regular interval? The word periodic itself means repeating at regular intervals. So the table is periodic because we find that every time we get to that particular group on the periodic table, whether it's the alkali metals or the halogens or any other column, there tend to be properties that are in common. And so because we hit that column and we find a very reactive nonmetal gas, or we find a very reactive alkali metal, um, we find that repeating property. Every time we come around to that same column on the periodic table, we find those properties in common. That's the periodic part. So much like you might have a magazine subscription for something, I get Sports Illustrated, that, that, that arrives once a week. And if everything's on schedule, it arrives the same day of the week, every week. You might have a magazine that arrives once a month, and you can always expect it around the same day of the month. Maybe you get a, a you know something that, that arrives once a year, uh, or even quarterly or something. Uh, so the same kind of rhythm to things. Even our daily schedule at school, where the bells ring at the same time every day, um, is, is a periodic thing. And of course, they're called periods for that reason. And so many things that we take for granted are periodic. In fact, kind of it's what makes the world go around. Uh, your favorite TV show comes on at the same time all the time because it's a periodic sort of pattern. Well, Moles is our last character as far as periodic table goes. Uh, we're not going to add anything else to it. Um, what we'll do in our in, in class, if by the time you watch this video, hopefully you, you'll be getting this in before we get to that lab, and that's lab 23, which is a fun one I like to do. Uh, if, if you're watching this afterwards, hopefully that lab went okay for you and that'll make more sense now having seen a little bit of what, for, for example, in this case, what Mendeleev did to make his, uh, his periodic table and make his predictions about the elements' properties that were yet to be discovered. That's it for this unit. And uh, if you have any questions on anything we've gone over, please catch me in class um, and let me know what those will be. Uh, or go back and watch a previous video. Try to find that topic that you're struggling on. Maybe it's classification of matter. Uh, maybe it's changes. Maybe it's properties. And go back and review those things as best you can and then try to come up with some more questions that we can go over. Just stop and see me and I can talk you through some stuff. 
as part of your early review for a test coming up not too far down the road. Talk to you later.